So I'm Aaron Kaufman, uh, owner of Arclight Fab, and you're in Arclight Fab here in Grand Prairie, Texas. So in in high school, for me, it's like having an appetite or an interest in these things. And we always went to car shows. My dad built hot rods uh, and street cars, drag cars, stuff like that, long before I existed. Whenever the kids came, my dad chose his responsibilities and all the fun stuff basically went, went on ice and just stopped. Um, so get done with high school and you know, and I'm working just a regular job, work for Pet Boys as an installer. And then a friend of mine, Scott, which we had gone, we'd done a couple things together and even done some television. His, his family had owned a machine shop and they worked on race cars or built, you know, shifter carts and other race cars and uh, did like oil field equipment. So there was mills and lays and welders. And so without too much, you know, oversight, I got to learn how to run a mill and a lathe and weld and this and that and use a cutting torch. After doing it for a while and realizing like my success rate was reasonably high, I mean everything worked and we were understanding the concepts or you know starting to, uh, basically there was an air ride shop in town and uh, he had just got going and, and I, I offered him a solution that worked out well for both of us. You hire me, I have a job and I won't be your competition. And it worked out, and so I went to work for the uh, what was momentarily the Hack Shack, and, and ultimately ended up being drop zone for quite a few years, and every, you know largely an air ride shop, and that's what we did is a lot of it. And then as things progressed, I had left, and I had my own little shop, and learning the woes of overhead and running a business and things, and not to say that I did it well, but it was happening and building parts and shipping things. First time I sat down with Richard, he was pretty open about where he wanted to go. He wanted to be on TV, wanted to be famous, wanted to have this big hot rod shop stuff. You know, I thought it was pie in the sky, but he seemed pretty convinced and he was willing to spend money on it. So I said, yeah, and there was a lot of cool stuff to work on. And so we, we worked on this, went to shows, he bought all the big stuff, did all the right things. And um, we had ultimately closed up shop at, you know, over some years. And it, it, we had shot a pilot for a, a show that was not this. It was a, more of a travel show based around hot rod culture and lifestyle. And it was uh, shot for a 3D network that never launched for Discovery on 3D, but it never happened. So I'm working at Fool Parts all these years later. And Richard rolls in and says, hey, they want to shoot a new sizzle reel, which is the thing you use to sell a television show. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy here. I can't take three days off. He said, well, don't say no, just call me later. So I called him there and said, I can, I can give you two days, not three, no problem. We shot a little sizzle reel for what would become Fast and Loud. Um, around two weeks later, we were shooting the show. So, so that was cool. We got into it, and uh, they ordered six episodes. Before we were done with six, they had ordered six more to make it 12. Before we were done with the 12, they had ordered 24, and we did 24 shows, uh, The you know, the like the first the first year there and uh, we did biker build off which was wild because I was doing the fast and loud show and the biker build off show at the exact same time you might say the success off of the last year's episodes on fast and loud and the biker build off thing we were able to move into the new shop we gained some wonderful sponsors uh, that really helped us outfit the shop and with better equipment with more funding more success of the show we were able to really kind of kick things into gear. And, you know, as you know, well, as you came on right there at that, you know, the kind of three quarters through the, the first year, right as things were really accelerating. And that's when we had the opportunity on television. Uh, amongst all the other things you learn about tele TV and, and, and all the struggles and the stress with it, the one thing we got to do is we kind of got to build the cars that we wanted to build uh, with, a, with a healthy budget. But the one caveat was they had to be built extremely fast. And so five years, uh, five years after that, uh, I had kind of had enough, and and obviously Richard and I were uh, having a difficulty being in the same building together. And so I really, it was his building, it's his show, it's his operation, and I was I was happy to to move on with things. 
I think it was a, an absolute blessing that I got to do so many things. Uh, we had to use the television's power to be able to accomplish all these great things. But what a wonderful experience. I got to build a lifetime's worth of cars in five years. There, a lot of things happened in the wake of, of my leaving and uh, a few of the guys at the shop uh, were, were let loose from the, from the monster, from the gas monkey. And so I had guys that knew the program, knew what was up, and we were all homies. And, and uh, television wasn't quite done with me yet, and they, they wanted to do some stuff. And so you and I had obviously interest in the F-100 trucks, and but like once again, just the funding. Like I didn't have, I mean, I'd been making a good wage, and I had some money, but it wasn't enough to, like, to do big stuff, you know, it just wasn't. And so the TV, it really amps up the money, but they also want a lot of things from you, you know? And so, we had hunted for a building for about a year, moving into the next show, the Shifting Gears, which we didn't really know. Uh, but after about a year of searching for a building, we, we were forced, we had signed contracts and we were forced into getting a building in about three weeks. Got a building that was enormous because it was the only thing on the market and it was time to go. And then we jumped right into Shifting Gears, which really was fast and loud version two, if you will, except for I kind of pushed this instead of a buy-sell kind of model. It was really about building vehicles for an experience. And because I'm very interested in automobile competition, right, racing, um, the vehicles were built around, a lot of times, motorsport or performance. Uh, the one thing that, that really, that kind of was hard for me to deal with is like, just like on the TV show, except for building the cell, we were building to go and do something. So a lot of times we are finishing the vehicle, if you could call it that, on the trailer, in the parking lot, at the event. I even reached out and asked if I wanted to come to the, the Pikes Peak race. And so I went in 13 when Sebastian Loeb um, set the record. And I went, checked it out, saw how it all went down, and I was enamored I was it was it was all I could think about I loved everything about everything about it was what I wanted to do and uh, racing a circuit race on a track is cool but like point-to-point -point races have my imagination rally hill climb desert it's like that that was what I it was in a place that I wanted to be racing cars that I wanted to be in and I finally had a car and so so my racing really starts here in one of the scariest, wildest places with virtually no experience. And uh, I, because of the popularity of the TV show, I don't believe any of this would have been possible for myself if it hadn't been for the television show or for, quite frankly for anyone with, with very little, next to no experience. And so we put a race car together and I contacted the people and they said, they said, hey, if you want to come do it, we'd love to have you. Would y'all be interested in building a pace, the pace vehicle? And so along with allowing me to race, they allowed us to build the pace vehicle, which uh, fulfilled an obligation to build a vehicle on the show. And so we put a car together, finished mine, went up there, and my, they were really open-minded, and they wanted to see how well you're doing on your other races. So they asked me before, how many races are you going to? call us afterwards, tell us how you did, what the results were, all these things, and then it uh, required me to go to tire testing, and then even on practice week, and if people don't know, Pikes Peak is, is the second oldest race in America. The oldest is the Indy 500. It only predates uh, the hill climb by a, few, uh, by a few months, and 1916 was the first race, and the times, oddly enough, were not slow by today's standards, but not slow by, by any means, um, and for over 100 years ago. And so the, it is American through and through. Despite how few people know anything about it, uh, we start at somewhere around 9,000 feet and we finish at 14,100 feet. Uh, it's hard to breathe up there. If the cars came off the ground, the FAA required that you were running oxygen in a non-compressed you know, uh, cabin. And so it's a feat, right? It's hard on the cars, it's hard on the drivers, it's a difficult place and not really a place for, for newbies to be, but they, they wanted to verify that my brain was in the right place, my, my head was. And so even a practice week, we, we register and go through tech on Monday, we practice Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. in the morning on the mountain before the park opens. And it wasn't, it wasn't until Friday at lunch I got have a good race. They wanted to make sure that it, my intention was not to kill myself and drive my car off the mountain. So while not blisteringly fast my first year, I had a wonderful, successful run. I know many people with very fast cars that have not been up the mountain yet. And so I've been, I've been very lucky that I was able to pilot the vehicle up there in a respectable time, 
and make it to the summit on my, on my first attempt. But race cars are expensive and hanging on to them and keeping them in racing condition is expensive too. So my racing, well, I definitely wouldn't use the word career, but the, my race and the bulk of my racing has been all over the place. And I have, I, have, I have adored that, but I'm also at a point where I'd really like to do something enough to really focus on it and get good and try and put wins and potentially championships, you know, you know, on the wall, but like that's not that's not the place that we're at. But the television and my interest in building hot rods, cutting and welding, and chopping up mini trucks in the driveway when I was 16 and 17 led me to the top of Pikes Peak, and it's been really one of the more poignant things that that uh, that I've ever done because it really it, it is such a crazy race to go race. It is such a, a heavy thing to go do and you build such a bond with the people that go race that race that it opened a lot of other motorsport doors and uh, it has really been, I mean, the uh, for me, the flavor of life. It really has been the exciting part of it is getting to go race these cars in other places, particularly on the mountain at Pikes Peak. And uh, anyone who's been there, you'll understand. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crazy place. It's my favorite racetrack of any racetrack I've ever been. And you know, building cars has opened up the world to so many wild experiences globally for me. Uh, and it all started with uh, chopping up little trucks in the driveway. I mean, when I think back on it, I mean, I'm blown away at the amount of things that I've gotten to go do. And not all of them in a race car, just all of these big experiences. The one thing I would say is, this is the only thing that's held true, and not between being excited about work or what I do or being depressed in life, just, oh, just whatever the ebb and flow is, one thing has always been true. And uh, it's the only real piece of advice that I have that I think actually applies no matter who you are, no matter what it is you're trying to do or where you're trying to get to, is that uh, opportunity favors the prepared. There is no way around that. That is a simple fact of life. It's if you are not prepared to accept the opportunity, it doesn't matter how loud it knocks on the door, if it kicks the door and it walks in the middle of your living room, if you're not prepared to accept the, the opportunity, it might as well have never have, uh, materialized. And so the things that you want, if you put yourself in front of them and, and realize like what it is your, the, the, things that, the things that you want in life, if you see where they're happening, and I do mean physically and you know, metaphorically, put yourself in line for the opportunity to find you and be prepared to take it on. When it does happen, you'll make the best of it. You'll be successful. Those things will happen. You'll find your way into it. But if you sit on your couch and just say, yo, man, it sure would be nice. Oh, man, it would be nice. You know what I mean? It's like, suppose it does come and knock on the door. You're not in a position. You're not prepared to take advantage of it. So the only real piece of advice I have through all the experiences I've had is that my answer has always been yes. Do you want to? My answer has always been yes. And it's like, even when an experience I thought was uh, beyond my capability, I was gonna move my capability to meet the demand, right? Whenever I, I thought that, that I wasn't strong enough or smart enough or had enough experience, it was, well, the opportunity is here, I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna apply everything I have behind, apply it to it and see if, we can, if I can pull out a success, right? And you know, a success doesn't always mean a win, but having a positive outcome. And so that's it. I mean, just quite simply put, is the things you want in life is to put yourself where those things are happening and be prepared to, to grab hold when it shows up, because it will show up. And if you're not prepared, it'll pass you by. It's that simple.